Hello and welcome to the Ohio Health EMS Grand Round Series. My name is Eric Cortez. I serve as the System EMS Medical Director for Ohio Health. I'm joined by our System EMS Manager, Barb Dean. Our guest for this episode is Dr. Bruce Fleshman, a cardiologist at Grant Medical Center. Dr. Fleshman, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Cortez. Our topic today is going to revolve around the issue of chest discomfort evaluation. So we'll start out with a short case presentation, and then we'll hand it over to Dr. Fleshman to work through a chest discomfort evaluation from a pre-hospital perspective. Our case will be a 53-year-old female that calls for chest discomforts with radiation of that discomfort to the right side of her chest and down to her right arm. She has a history of hypertension and hyperlipidemia, but no other medical problems. Your physical assessment is relatively un unremarkable with no increased work of breathing, lung sounds that are unremarkable, and no lower extremity swelling. Dr. Fleshman, I'll hand it over to you to work through this evaluation. Perfect, thank you. The first thing, I, I love the fact that you are calling it a chest discomfort evaluation because I don't, chest pain by itself is not cardiac in origin, really. Um, chest pain, is a a lot of people will say no i don't have any pain and then they may be quiet and and won't answer any more of your questions and that's where chest discomfort you then give them a multiple choice or give them an idea or a concept of is it tight heavy pressure fullness squeezing burning any of the other discomforts that are really associated with a cardiac form of chest discomfort so i always tell my students don't use the word pain when you're talking to uh, a patient and I also don't like them to use the word sharp because sharp means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Sharp to you and me most likely is a stabbing discomfort where a lot of times sharp means that it's just an intense discomfort and very uncomfortable. So when you're evaluating a person with discomfort, especially looking for a cardiac origin, one of the things I always like to mention is that from an emergency room standpoint, and then therefore probably an EMS standpoint, you're looking for what is the likelihood they have coronary disease. When I look at the patient, I'm looking at and making a decision is what is the likelihood that the chest discomfort is from the coronary standpoint. So for example, if you had a diabetic hypertensive smoker, strong family history of coronary disease with chest pressure, obviously the likelihood that they have coronary disease is great, but that does not necessarily mean that the discomfort that they're having is necessarily cardiac. So what's interesting about this patient is that the call-in is for chest discomfort that's going to the right side. So first of all, where does the chest pain go in general? Where does it go typically and where can it go? So. Typically, it's chest discomfort that radiates to the neck or to the left arm, okay? However, discomfort can be anywhere from the jaw down to the epigastric region, either arm, the back, and between the shoulder blades. So that's really important to understand. So certainly where the discomfort is important, but then also associated symptoms and signs and duration of the discomfort is important. So in that person who complained of a typical type of discomfort with the pressure going to the right side, you then have to look at what it was the duration. Typical angina, okay, and angina is not an infarct, but it's angina, usually lasts two to 10 minutes, nothing longer than that. Anything longer than that is either going to be an infarct or wanting to be an infarct. So for example, if you have chest discomfort, that's been there for six hours and you go to the ER and your troponins are negative, I tell them if I am convinced through the history that it lasted continuously for six hours, then no matter what their previous past medical history is, it's a non-cardiac discomfort. They should have positive enzymes or an EKG changes if they've had continuous discomfort for greater than an hour. And that's again, the hardest thing is being from a history standpoint, making sure that it was you are 100% convinced. So you got to ask them, did you fall asleep? What, you know, did it wax and wane? Did it come and go? How did you, uh, why didn't you go to the ER two hours ago or three hours ago? Or why didn't you call us before that? So those are just some of the 
questions that you need to continue to follow up with an examination when you're evaluating these people at their homes. So first thing I would do is when talking to them is how long does the discomfort last and whether it was still present at the time that we're talking to them, whether they're short of breath, whether they're diaphoretic. I also watch to see how they describe the discomfort, whether they're using their fists and showing tightness or squeezing or where they rub it to. You know, heart discomfort is not pinpointed. So if they used one finger and pointed to the right side of the chest towards that, and then I ask them just that one spot, that's not cardiac. They're gonna more use their hand and press it across their chest or squeeze it across their chest. So, you know, being observant to how they talk to you is really important in that evaluation. So, Dr. Cortez, that would be my first thought is asking those questions about the duration uh, of the discomfort, any associated symptoms or signs. Hopefully that's helpful in that respect. Yes, I, I think that was extremely helpful to go through the specifics of history taking with chest discomfort patients. I think a lot of times we get moving too fast and we move towards adv more advanced diagnostics and we forget to ask the questions regarding the history. And as with most things in medicine and in EMS, you get most of your information from asking pointed questions to the patient and, and establishing a good historical perspective of the chief complaint, which in this case would be chest discomfort. Um, once, once we've moved beyond the history taking, Dr. Fleshman, what are we looking for on physical exam, pertinent positives and pertinent negatives uh, in our chest discomfort patients? That's a good question because when you're evaluating chest discomfort patients, 99.9% .9 of it is the history, okay? Now, if they're sick, then that's where the one to 10% are diaphoretic. You look for diaphoresis, you look for them being short of breath, but you may not have anything on their physical examination that gives you any um, sign that the chest discomfort is ischemic in origin, again, unless they're sick. So what you would look for is that if they're sick, they're hypotensive, they have neck veins that's elevated, they may have rails. So those things just you know, make it more the severity of the illness as opposed to the potential severity of the illness. And that's what, you know, what it's all about is what is the potential illness? You know, just another example, you know, I talked about that person that had six hours worth of discomfort with negative enzymes and they had all the risk factors and the likelihood they have coronary disease is positive, but the chest discomfort did not seem to be cardiac in origin. Well, on the other side, I had a patient just a couple of weeks ago who was 40 years old, no risk factors, and came into the emergency room because over the weekend they were mowing the lawn and they noticed their arms starting to feel heavy. Okay, and it only lasted for 10 minutes and it went away, but the person was concerned enough that they went to the emergency room to get it checked out on the Monday morning before work. Well, it concerned me enough and ended up doing a cardiac catheterization where they had a high grade lesion in a circumflex. So again, it's showing two things that the history, in my opinion, supersedes anything else in a chest discomfort evaluation. So that's basically where I would go with that. From a past medical history, uh, you, you mentioned a few things such as smoking and diabetes and hypertension. Uh, what other factors should we be asking for in, in regards to past medical history, social history, and family history? Well, I think you, you brought up the big part. Family history is very important. So the five major things is what we just, you mentioned is diabetes, hypertension, smoking, hyperlipidemia, and family history. Those are the five major risk factors. Now in an EMS situation, you also have drug use and drug abuse, right? So there's, so there's certain things like cocaine that can cause coronary spasm and cause coronary events acutely. I just did a patient this morning, interestingly enough, who she's 50 years old, has hypertension, and she had classic story of chest discomfort with positive enzymes, and EKG had some T-wave inversions, but interestingly enough, her enzymes are only mod mild to moderately elevated. And I catch her this morning and she had no coronary disease and ended up having uh, LV dysfunction like a taco subo. Do you know, all know what taco subo is? That's stress-induced cardiomyopathy that can present just like an infarct, 
And so I would also ask them, did anything acute stressful happen to you? And so, so that's an important uh, history in that respect. So something could have happened such as a death in the family or uh, other kind of stress that had happened that caused this uh, neurocardio type of uh, effect. But again, you know, I was just saying, you know, the, the, the history is important. And I say that's number one. And then the other factors as, as far as the contributing factors is, is certainly important. But the decision should be made based on your history. And then the other contributory secondary findings of past medical history and family history should, should only seal the deal for you. Well, that's certainly helpful, especially with the undifferentiated patients that EMS encounters. You know, there's a, there's a large list of differential diagnoses for chest discomfort. You know, you certainly think about pulmonary emboli, aortic dissections, pneumonia. There's, the list can go on and on and on. Right. Um, we're specifically looking at uh, cardiac causes of that chest discomfort and uh, I 100% agree that your history and physical is really going to narrow that that large undifferentiated list down to a, a handful of, of diagnoses that we should be considering. When we move on from history taking and, and physical examination, let's move on to the 12 lead evaluation. Can you discuss of all chest discomfort patients, who do you really want to see a 12 lead EKG performed on? And what are you looking for on those 12 leads? And how do you differentiate some of the false positives that we can see on 12 leads? So that's a great question because obviously when you're doing an EKG, you're looking for any evidence of active ischemia. So that would be T wave inversions, ST depressions, and then of course in, in an infarct, ST elevation. However, that's not the deciding factor as we were talking about of whether the patient should come to the emergency room or not. But, but it's very helpful information because it talks about the acuity and then your treatment uh, as far as nitroglycerin and heparin or what you uh, would do from the squad standpoint as to uh, contributing to the pre-hospital care. So the important thing as far as looking at EKGs are two things. And when we're looking for ischemia, the two things that we look for are T wave inversions and ST elevation, or I'm sorry, ST depression. However, they have to be in contiguous leads. And contiguous leads means in a coronary artery distribution. So you have the right coronary, which is 2, 3, and AVF. You have the LAD, which is V1 through V3. You have the lateral leads, which are V4 through V6 and 1 and AVL. So you need to have them in contiguous leads. If you have them sparsely throughout and, and it makes no rhyme or reason, that's where we go into the nonspecific mode. And we say nonspecific or can't exclude or talk like radiologists. <laughs> <laughs> but you're looking for, for those things. And, and, and again, those type of findings certainly is going to increase what you're going to do as far as pre-hospital care, aspirin. Et cetera. So Dr. Fleshman, so we've, we've narrowed our chest discomfort through our history taking and physical exam to chest discomfort where we're worried about a cardiac cause, a potential coronary cause, and we have completed a 12 lead EKG. And there's a few different pathways that can happen from here. If we have an EKG that meets our, our STEMI criteria, the ST elevation and two or more contiguous leads, then we go down the STEMI pathway with the MS. Um, but before we walk down that pathway with some treatment strategies, let's go down the other pathway where maybe we have our T wave inversions or we have some ST segment depression with a concerning history. Uh, a lot of times our EMS providers will get feedback from the hospital that the patient suffered an end STEMI or they were having unstable angina. Can you discuss what, what an end STEMI is and unstable angina and contrast that with a STEMI? Sure. So unstable angina is really defined by three things. And that's typical angina, which we discuss. And typical angina is exertionally related 
and it'll relieve by rest. So that's what typical angina is. Unstable angina is one of three things, and that is a change in the pattern. So it was happening when I walked uh, two blocks. Now I can't even get up and go to the bathroom without getting the chest discomfort or the shortness of breath or the associated symptoms. So a progression or change in the pattern. The other is having rest discomfort. Now the key thing with rest discomfort, when people think of rest discomfort, six hours of discomfort isn't rest discomfort from a cardiac origin unless it's an infarct, okay? So if somebody has rest discomfort from an acute coronary syndrome, unstable angina, it's usually, again, eight to 20 minutes in, you know, two to 20 minutes in duration, and it comes and goes in that respect. So it's not a prolonged episode. And then the last is new onset angina. So for example, that 42 year old just started over the weekend, that's new onset. If somebody has been having discomfort for the past month, it's usually a, uh, one to two months of new onset exertional symptoms or these intermittent rest symptoms. That's what's considered um, an unstable picture and a new onset, okay? So that's how we define unstable angina. And they may have totally normal EKGs, okay? And a lot of times, when they're calling the EMS, it's their first episode of rest discomfort. So that's where, again, history is important to know, is this an un unstable picture or not? When we get into a non-STMI, we typically have people that have discomfort for a longer period of time. So anywhere from you know, more than 20 minutes. So they go from 20 to 30 minutes, their discomfort's gone. And what happens by definition, you have either EKG changes and or enzyme changes but you don't have any Q waves and you don't have any ST elevation. So that's where we talk about non-STEMI, okay? And then we have obviously STEMI with ST elevation. Well, I think that's very useful information. We hear these terms a lot and sometimes they can get convoluted as to what's actually going on with the patient. So I think that's a nice breakdown of those three concerning processes that we sometimes encounter with our chest discomfort patients. So with our case, we've established a concerning history. We've done a pointed exam. And let's just say that we've obtained a 12 lead EKG that is uh, concerning for a STEMI. Dr. Fleshman, can you walk us through the essential treatment steps that need to happen in the pre-hospital setting before the patient gets to the hospital and the cath lab? Certainly. What I, what I think is important, and the question is the order of everything too, but a sublingual nitro. I think that's important to at least try once. The reason being is that if you're having a, an acute MI, uh, nitroglycerin is not gonna reverse that, right? But it might help enough little bit of spasm that it might restore some flow. So I think it's important to give a sublingual nitroglycerin. Then certainly aspirin, and, and I think we're great at giving baby aspirin all the time. So I think baby aspirin is very, very important. And then after that, I'm not sure all the medications that you have at your disposals, whether you can give heparin bolus or um, sometimes depending on the discomfort, with whether or not you can give a, a morphine type of medication. But, but those are the most important things pre or pre-hospital. Yeah. Yeah, most, uh, most EMS agencies will be carrying aspirin and uh, everyone is very good about administering aspirin. It's been a, right. it's been a quality parameter for quite some time now. Uh, nitroglycerin is very common to be carried on, on EMS trucks as well, as well as morphine and or fentanyl for, for pain control and controlling right. that sympathetic overdrive. Heparin is less common, um, commonly carried on EMS agencies. Um, with, with, uh, once we've given these treatments, um, can you talk next about the importance of pre-notification by EMS to the hospital and uh, the, the processes that go on to activate the cath lab and take the patient from the field that's having a STEMI uh, to definitive care within the cath lab? Sure. So once that EKG is transmitted, it goes to the emergency room and or our phones also, okay? And it is reviewed as to whether or not it uh, looks to be a STEMI, okay? 
The next thing that happens is that we are called and we call in the cath lab. And again, we're talking if this is after hours. And if it's during hours, we call the cath lab and everybody's alerted and we get a room ready for the patient that as soon as they get there, whether it's during hours and we're here already or after hours and we're waiting for everybody to get in and get everything prepared for the STEMI. The, once the patient gets into the emergency room or the first thing that was done is they do get a heparin bolus. And the purpose for the heparin bolus is because most MIs are caused by a ruptured plaque and a clot. And that clot can propagate. And as it propagates, it gets bigger and bigger and it can uh, get side vessels or it can just clog up the whole situation when you're trying to open up the vessel. So heparin prevents clot propagation. And that's again, the same reason they give it an acute pulmonary emboli too. So that's what one of the acute things that we'll do. Then they go and are being evaluated. Now, one of the things I think we ought to discuss is inferior infarcts, okay? Because there's question of should a nitro be given in an inferior infarct? Typically, what you have to remember is that nitroglycerin, when we give a sublingual nitroglycerin, we're giving 400 micrograms of nitro, which is a big dose because when we order a nitro drip, they're only on 10 to 30 micrograms. So, so it's a significant decrease as far as what we're giving sublingually. So at that dose, when you get over 100 micrograms, you're not only getting venodilatation, coronary dilatation, but you also get peripheral arterial dilatation also. So a lot of people can get hypotensive when given a sublingual nitro. In the setting of an acute infarct, in an inferior acute infarct, if it's affecting the right ventricle, then it can also affect your blood pressure and the volume also, because then you're decreasing that significantly. So the biggest thing when you're evaluating those people and you see an acute inferior is making sure you have a good IV and good fluid you know, uh, saline hanging at the time. And if their pressure is good, I still give a sublingual nitro personally, just making sure you have a good IV line and you can give fluids if you need to. Because again, on an RV infarct, what do you need? You need fluids, okay? So you, you give fluids and then you may be causing enough venodilatation to cause some hypotension, no question about it. But I, I personally think that the benefits outweigh the negative because not all of them, not all of them are uh, RV infarcts because the RV uh, branch comes in the mid right corner and a lot of times it's in the mid distal or after that branch. So that's one thing I wanted to discuss is, is nitroglycerin in those situations. So what happens is you call this, uh, you send in the EKG, the EKG goes to the ER, they call you back and confirm it's a STEMI and they call us and we call the cath lab and we get everything ready. and depending on the time they go directly to the cath lab or they come to the emergency room. But we do like to get the, the, the heparin on board prior to getting into the cath lab, so ideally. So with the STEMI, then the, then the definitive care will, will be all of those medications that we talked about and then in the cath lab will be basically taking off the occlusion from one of the coronary vessels when, so I think a lot of our providers are familiar with that process. Can you just comment briefly on, you know, what happens to those patients that have a good story, they have ST segment and or T wave changes, and maybe they fall within that NSTEMI or unstable angina pathway. What happens to those patients within the first 24 hours of hospitalization? So again, they are, placed on uh, the, their aspirin, a beta blocker, nitrates, and heparin, and they get cathed within 24 hours. So in fact, the lady I mentioned this morning uh, came in last night with a, an, an, an NSTEMI. So she did not have acute ST changes, but her enzymes were elevated, her EKG had T-wave inversions. She was on a heparin drip and we cathed her this morning. So it seems like a lot of the treatment is very similar. It's just a matter of if, if it needs to happen right now or as soon as possible for a STEMI versus uh, 
versus more of an urgent pathway for NSTEMIs and unstable angina. Exactly. Dr. Fleshman, with, in regards to 12 leads, I have just two follow-up questions for you. Number one is, um, do you have any tips or, or pieces of advice for uh, when to do a right-sided 12 lead, when to do a posterior 12 lead? And then the follow-up to that is, um, what are some false positives for STEMIs that we typically encounter on uh, 12 lead EKGs? Well, the first question is, as far as an RV infarct or a posterior infarct. So what I always like to teach as far as posterior is that's exactly opposite of anterior. So you have ST depression in V1, 2, and 3 as opposed to ST elevation. So then the next question you have to ask is if you have three to four millimeters of ST depression, if they're having continuous significant chest discomfort and it's not relieved by a nitro then it has to be an injury pattern and not an ischemia pattern because if you have let's say t wave inversions inferiorly and they're having chest discomfort and you give a nitro and it goes away that's an unstable non-st type of situation but if you have st depression specifically in the v1 through v3 leads and it does not get relieved with nitroglycerin. You have to think about a posterior. Okay, so again, it's all history related and your gut instinct on what that patient looks like. Okay, and that's how I would relate it and not necessarily do it. The right side of EKGs, again, I think is more important in people that are significantly hypotensive and having chest discomfort and look bad, then it may very well help as far as volume resuscitation and other type of things to, to uh, pre-hospital, get that patient ready to be admitted. As far as things that obviously um, confuse, one is certainly the left bundle branch block, but it really shouldn't confuse you as much because in a left bundle branch block, what do you have? You have a very wide QRS, okay? So you just have to be confident knowing that it's a Q, that the QRS is wide and that whenever you get a depolarization abnormality like a wide QRS you have a repolarization abnormality and that involves your STT waves now again in a left bundle branch block if the story is good and they look bad you have to presume it may be an infarct because it can hide infarcts there are some criteria where they look at the uh, amount of ST elevation and I don't think you should really get into that. That's not, the, the decision is really a clinical one. They need to go to the lab or not, okay? So that's certainly one that can, that can um, confuse people with the left bundle branch block. But again, you fall back on your history and, and have that help you out. The other is left ventricular hypertrophy. There's a lot of people with, uh, with uh, significant hypertension have left ventricular hypertrophy and they have what we call repole abnormalities where they can get ST elevations in the anterior leads and some depressions in the lateral leads. And that can very well be confusing and um, mimic a myocardial infarction. Certainly pericarditis, okay? Although their chest discomfort is a different feeling than it is, you know, it's more uh, position related and you may or may not hear a rub when you're evaluating those patients, but pericarditis is another one that can look like an infarct, but uh, isn't. The other one is an LV aneurysm, okay? So if you have a patient that is complaining of chest discomfort and they have a history of having an infarct a year ago, they can have persistent ST elevation, which you can see in people that have developed an LV aneurysm. So that can very well be tricky in, in that respect. Also trying to know, is this acute or is this not acute? So those are a few examples, unless you got something, Eric, that I forgot offhand. No, that... That was that was extensive. That that was excellent. That was a nice review of of some of the other things that our providers need to be considering, uh, and at, at least keep in the back of their minds when evaluating an EKG and trying to determine if it meets STEMI criteria versus not. Uh, Dr. Fleshman, I have one more follow up question for you. You know, as you're well aware, you, you know we we are working through the COVID pandemic and. 
a lot of healthcare has changed because of the pandemic. What impact has COVID had on uh, the cardiology world and specifically chest discomfort uh, and acute myocardial infarctions, if any? Well, you know, it's interesting because when I look back and I thought it was very interesting that back in March, April, and May, the amount of infarcts went down dramatically. And I was thinking, wow, is this a viral thing? You know, that by social distancing and people staying away, that there's none of these acute inflammatory responses that cause plaque rupture. And then there were other articles saying, well, people were staying home because they were afraid to go to the hospital with that. We, we ran into a couple of those, but not as many as we thought. And again, as we started to socialize more, the amount of infarcts have increased again. I, I just find that amazing. I don't know the the answer or the reasons or what, but but I think that's a, a, a thought of inflammatory responses occurring from minor little viral things that we may or may not get. I don't, I don't know. From the uh, other standpoint, certainly, uh, um, I think people are starting now to come in more, whether or not with the rise in the cases, they're going to stop coming. I, we'll, we'll find out. But um, from the in-hospital population, we see a lot of um, patients that certainly develop some cardiac complications and troponins and um, non-STMIs, and there's some that come in with acute infarcts, but we haven't seen a lot of that, and atrial dysrhythmias and things of that sort. But um, that's really what's really affected us as far as COVID is concerned. Yeah, those are very interesting trends that you point out, and I think it's interesting how how each field of medicine has been uniquely impacted by COVID in unexpected manners sometimes. Um, Dr. Fleshman, I want to thank you for uh, participating in this EMS Grand Rounds. I think our discussion on chest discomfort was excellent. You provided a lot of teaching points for our EMS providers. Uh, do you have any closing thoughts for us? Well, you know, it's interesting when you're talking about what kind of changes in this new COVID world. I wonder when we're going to have telehealth with the EMS. You know, I think that's an interesting concept in a certain way. It might prevent hospitalizations. It might promote uh, different things. But, but uh, you know, it kind of sounds fun in a little bit, in a little ways, you know, that you're, you're there with the EMS and working on somebody and making decisions and helping making decisions. But that's really the only thought I have for the future. <laughs> I agree. Yeah, there's there's uh, a lot of options for telehealth and in, in all aspects of medicine, and there there have been some pilot programs across the country looking at the incorporation of telehealth services within EMS and 911 response, and it's exciting information. Yeah. Well, I so for, enjoyed this. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, sir. So for our listeners, uh, if you have any questions about any of this content, please feel reach feel free to reach out to me. My email is eric.cortez at ohiohealth.com, and I'll make sure that we, we get you the answer to your question or we'll find you the right information to, to help you with your questions or, or comments. Um, thank you, you for- Eric, you can feel free to do the same to me. You know, Excellent. For, well, it's bruce.fleischman at ohiohealth.com, so I'd be more than happy to also. Excellent, and yeah, so if there's questions, then you have- uh, direct access to the expert. So thank you, Dr. Fleshman, and thank you for all for listening. And uh, be sure to check out our website and our online learning on our website for a whole list of online learning activities, including these Ohio Health Grand Rounds series, our quick hitting online learning, as well as our uh, EMS podcasts and our virtual conferences, which are all posted to our website. Thank you very much for your time.